Welcome everyone to the weekly graduate seminars. My name is Sohrab and I'm a PhD student here at U of A under the supervision of Dr. Henry and Dr. Machuda. I'm glad to share with you what I've been working on in the past few months. This presentation, as you can see, is dedicated to the application of INSAR in landslide monitoring. I will first touch on the theory behind this method and carry on with showing you the latest cases we have analyzed. INSAR stands for Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, and the general idea behind its mechanism was originally inspired by regular radars used to track aircrafts and ships through heavy weather and darkness. With the same theory, it can be used for monitoring the ground and track its displacements. Unlike telescopes or other optical tools that work in the visual spectrum of electromagnetic waves, SAR technology works in the microwave domain and to avoid very long aperture sensors, radar experts have devised a signal processing strategy to use a shorter one, and that is why the term synthetic appears in the acronym. The orbiting satellite constantly transmits electromagnetic waves to the ground, which illuminates a footprint on its surface. Objects on the ground absorb, scatter away, and reflect back portions of signal energy to the sensor, and next time the satellite is passing the same point, it gets a second backscatter acquisition and comparing these two received waves can help us studying the ground. Like any other waves, they also have an amplitude and a phase. The amplitude component somehow resembles the aerial photograph, but the phase component consists of speckles that looks very random. However, if the phase of two backscattered waves received by satellite is subtracted, a pattern of concentric rams is obtained, which is known as interferogram. This interferogram can be transformed to displacement values after certain steps of processing the stages and removing unfavorable layers. Different items play a role in creating an interferogram, such as topography that needs to be addressed using the available uh, digital elevation models. Atmosphere is another factor. Free particles in the ionosphere and clouds, water, rain, and fog in the troposphere affect the propagation of a signal. Although these effects are quite chaotic, but having certain statistical characteristics help us filter these effects from an interferogram. Also, satellites do not capture star images repeatedly at exactly the same location, and these orbital variations impact the results. <clears throat> Moreover, random objects are arbitrarily distributed on the ground corresponding to each pixel that makes our measurements noisy, and for this, appropriate spatial filters should be employed. Even if we can manage to deal with all these, the waves are wrapped in the range of minus pi to plus pi, and we need to unwrap them. In figure 2b, we can see an example of one dimensional unwrapping process. In late 90s, numerous studies revealed that man made structures exhibit a very coherent radar return, but identification of such scatterers in rural areas was a big problem. To increase the density of detected points, and mitigate the atmospheric interferences, another subset of INSAR analysis emerged called multi-temporal INSAR analysis. As opposed to the old approach in which only two scenes were used, in this latest version, a stack of at least 20 scenes are employed. Using this variant, natural scatterers such as rock outcrops, hard unvegetated earth surfaces, and boulders will be more easily detected, as well as man-made structures such as buildings, streetlights, transmission towers, bridges, and dams. The cases that I will show you later have been performed using the multi-temporal insert analysis, as you can imagine that the most of materials in landslide-prone areas are natural with, the low, with low reflectivity properties. Displacement values that INSAR yields is only part of the actual value. INSAR gives the magnitude of displacement vector that is projected on the satellite's line of sight. The relationship between line of sight displacement rate and the actual horizontal and vertical displacement rates is mentioned here. In this formula, geometrical features of the sensor is also involved, incidence angle or theta and heading angle or alpha. Theta is the angle that the vertical axis makes with line of sight and alpha is the angle that the satellite flight direction makes with north direction. Satellite sweeps the globe in two different geometries, ascending and descending, which is also shown in figure five. Having these two geometries, we will be able to back calculate the components of movement, however, at the cost of ignoring south-north components. 
INSER have various applications, but the ones related to the geosciences are these. Fault characterization, calibration of geomechanical models in oil and gas sectors, monitoring volcanoes, seismic activities, areas prone to sinkhole, subsidence induced by tunneling, and finally landslides. On the right, you can see an example of successful single geometry INSAR analysis performed on Little Slide in Western Canada, in which the areas undergoing high rates of movements are spotted. The first study area that I'm going to talk about is the Old Man River Dam. It is in the south of Alberta, 80 kilometers east of Lethbridge. The dam construction was completed in 1992, but the ongoing displacements of the spillway and its adjacent areas were identified from the very beginning of construction in 1986. Previous studies reported several weak clay seams beneath the structure at different elevations with residual friction angles of 11 to 15 degrees. Alberta Ministry of Environment and Parks, along with other consultants, installed sloping clinometers and extensometers to monitor the spillway displacement and ensure the integrity of the structure. For this site, almost 300 SAR images archived by Sentinel-1 were analyzed with the geometries shown in figure eight. These images correspond to years 2014 to 2021. But before diving into the results, I would like to briefly review our existing knowledge on the displacement characteristics of the site using in situ measurements. In the left frame of figure nine, the average displacement rates of a spillway are shown after monitoring it from 1991 to 2015 by a total station. It is seen that the magnitude decreased from almost two, three millimeters per year on the headworks toward near zero values at the flip bucket with the general decreasing trend from east to west. The direction of these vectors show a strong eastward at the headworks, which rotates about 45 degrees on the way down to the mid -shoot. The displacement rates of the most active shear bands measured by sloping kilometers are also displayed in the right frame of figure nine. It is seen that the rates vary from 0.5 to 1.7 millimeter per year. And finally, in a comprehensive report prepared by the University of Alberta, long-term trends of displacement rates were established, reporting a decelerating trend converging toward one millimeter per year as seen in figure 10. Figure 11a presents the vertical displacement rates of this site. It is seen that the spillway, the rock outcrop, and the east portion of embankment, oh, sorry, the west portion of embankment are experiencing movements up to one millimeter per year, whether positive or negative, with a general spatial trend of decreasing toward lower elevations. It is noted that the accuracy of one, two millimeter per year is completely reasonable for INSAR. And as a result, those shown to be bulge, bulging at the rate of one millimeter per year can be moving at lower values or even subsiding. The same is also true for this region in the west east direction. This showed that the INSAR results match somehow with our previous knowledge. Moreover, it is seen that the top two thirds of embankment near to the east abutment are undergoing higher rates, up to five millimeters per year. If we assume that the horizontal displacement uh, direction, actually of the horizontal displacement on the embankment is orthogonal to the dam axis, it can be estimated that the total displacement rate at this hotspot can reach values of 15 millimeters per year. The hydrometric data of a nearby station measuring the level of Old Bar River were also downloaded from the website of Government of Canada. The ascending line of sight displacement of all points on the spillway were averaged as seen in this diagram. Red and blue points mark the displacements and river level respectively. I should add that an autocorrelation test was performed to find out how much the displacement diagram should be shifted until maximum similarity in trends are achieved. With almost 14 days latency, you can see that the average displacement of a spillway respond to the seasonal variations in river level very clearly. The second study area is the famous Thompson River Valley south of Ashcroft, British Columbia. In a 10 kilometer section of this valley, numerous slow moving slides are moving on sub horizontal shear zones. Most of them traverse significant infrastructures which highlights the necessity of surveillance on this corridor. 
The few monitoring locations in the valley do not allow for the characterizations of landslide, landslide activities due to their size and aerial coverage. Therefore, most of our knowledge on inactivity of these slides stem from the absence of notable impacts on infrastructure. More than 200 star images archived by Canadian Radar Sat 2 and European Sentinel-1 were analyzed for this area, covering the period of 2014 to 2020. On the right, you can see the line of sight displacement map obtained after analyzing Radar Sat 2. Bearing the noisy parts that is most likely induced by agricultural activities, we can see the location of active slides are detected while the rest of the valley is showing near zero displacement shown with light green. The most active regions are Ripley, Red Hills Toe, South ex Extension of South Slide, and the Toe of North Slide, also known as Solar Slump. Ripley and North Slides are relatively well studied in terms of velocity estimations using in situ means. As a result, I will focus on these two cases. But before going into results, I would like to go back to an equation I showed you earlier. Equation two was the formula to back calculate the vertical, east, west, and south, north components of movement. But the problem is we have only two geometries, ascending and descending, meaning that one of these components should be neglected. It can, mathematically show, it can be mathematically shown that the least erroneous assumption would be overlooking the south, north component, but making such assumption would induce some error in other components as well, since we cannot simply ignore one of the unknowns. That error has a linear relationship with the true value of south-north component, which can completely distort our estimations if a strong south-north movement are expected, which is the case for most of the slides in Thompson River Valley. To address this issue, we adopted another assumption that the velocity vectors should follow the natural terrain Equation three is the mathematical form of this statement that employs the elevation gradient and in west, east, and south, north direction. In this analysis, ground gradients were extracted from the SRTM digital elevation model that NASA freely and publicly provides. You can see this model for the part of Valley in figure 15. Figure 16 shows the magnitude, direction, and distribution of horizontal movements of Ripley. The inset feature is a displacement recorded by a system similar to GPS. Based on that, it is seen that points are moving toward the Thompson River at the rates of about 50 to 70 millimeters per year. The INSTAR results also show that the majority of active points are concentrated around values of 50 to 80 millimeters per year. Moreover, other studies reported horizontal displacements up to 130 millimeters per year as well, which is also seen in results here. Figure 17 also presents the vertical displacement rates, showing that most of points are moving downward at rates of about 10 millimeters per year. As a result, the average travel angle of Ripley is then computed to be about 10 degrees, with, uh, which matches with the translational nature of this slide. INSAR also successfully detected the active part of North slide that matches with the extents of solar slump. For visual purposes only, this part and adjacent areas are presented here. Figure 18 shows the magnitude, direction, and distribution of horizontal movements of North slide. The inset also features the in-situ measurements, and it is seen that points are moving toward the Thompson River at the rates of about 150 to 200 millimeters per year, and lower values of about 35 at east. Figure 18a also shows that the, around the same locations, points are moving at the same range. Figure 19, on the other hand, presents the vertical displacement range, range, showing that the majority of points do not show considerable movements, except for those in solar slump. And these are the references I use for today's talk. At the end, I would like to acknowledge the role of our supporters. This research was made possible by the Railway Ground Hazard Research Program, or RGHRP, which is funded by Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, Canadian Railway Company, Canadian Pacific Railway, and Transport Canada. RGHRP also includes partnerships with the Geological Survey of Canada and Queen's University. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you may have.
All right, great. Thank you so much, Sarah, for such an interesting and concise presentation on this topic. I say there are some potential applications of the INSAR. But let me find your hands on it, particularly landslides. Um, now, actually, I see someone with his hand. Right. That's me. Corey. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, no, Corey Fraze. Uh, 1998 grad of the geotechnical group at U of A. Um, thanks for continuing to put these on. Saurabh and I have met. Um, Saurabh, uh, really great work. Um, one of the interesting things, um, you know, uh, that I'm not sure if you've done, but something to consider um, in the Thompson is it looks like you have access to both. Well, I know there's pretty deep stacks of radar set and Sentinel over some of those slides. And, you know, <clears throat> I know when you're, when you're comparing Sentinel or radar set independently and you get ascending and descending tracks, you can resolve the, the vertical and the horizontal and east-west components of movement. One of the things that would be interesting that others have done, I haven't done, is to, because you are going to get slightly different incidence angles, the, you know, the, and potentially slight differences in the, in the look direction, in the estimate, is potentially um, looking at how much further you can move and kind of getting a kind of a true vector um, of movement by integrating the, the two different satellites. You know, it's some, something to think about. I'm not sure if you have thought about it. Um, you know, there was some work done uh, over a decade ago by um, Paolo Farina, where they first started looking at that in Italy. I think it's part of his PhD. Anyway, it's just, just something to consider. Um, and also, I put a question in the chat about old man. Um, was that analysis based on the Sentinel ascending and descending? Oh, yeah. Uh, we actually used uh, about 150 ascending and also the same number for descending orbit. Um, yeah, for the old man river dam. And also, uh, it was kind of a, um, a, a kick in analysis to see what sort of results we can get from the software that we're using and, and if we can benchmark the results with, with our existing knowledge on the site. So we started with Sentinel-1 and I think, um, as you mentioned actually in the chat box, uh, in the next steps would be like, it's a good idea to go over other missions and see see if we can actually reconstruct the, the results that we got from the institute measurements with NSER as well. That would yeah. be a very interesting thing. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, theoretically, <laughs> based on data availability, you can, you know, can theoretically go back to 1992, even though, you know, the, uh, you know, the data might not be there. But again, it's it is one that, um, you know, if you, if you, as, a, as a researcher, if you, if the data is there, it would always interesting to see how you can can, you know, and this is really both the questions are about trying to piece together the different satellite, the different SAR satellites and different data to, to help complement one another. Um, you know, typically, yeah, we just grab one one stack, one sensor and move on that. But yeah, that would be great. Interesting. Anyways, yeah. thanks. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, actually, that's a good idea. But I like the air quotes because uh, uh, theoretically speaking, also Sentinel-1 should provide uh, images from 2014, so on. And, and for many cases, I, I was looking into I couldn't find any, I don't know, star image, for example, from a from a, from descending orbit or something. It, it's not always complete, but we'll definitely look into that as well. And also for the Thompson River Valley, you mentioned, uh, so that was kind of sort of a thing that I did that I, I kind of integrated the descending radar set to and the and ascending uh, Sentinel one. So to get two of those components of movements, but uh, at the same time, I, I didn't want to ignore the north. South North component because I did at the first time and I noticed that it's too erroneous because the points that that uh, that we know that are subsiding or moving downward turn out to be bulging and moving upward and I figured out that's because probably because of ignoring that South North component because it it has a, it has a very big effect on those other components so so to solve that to resolve that issue actually I use that digital elevation model to um to consider that the third component but somehow for two, two those two other components i uh, use both of the geometries of radar set two and sentinel one i don't know if that kind of yeah, i know it, it'd just be interesting if you had both ascending and descending both sentinel and radar sat okay um, i see mm. if you could you know and 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 and, and over overlapping time periods as well and that's that's the issue right is 
because you, depending on the imaging mode, you will have a slightly different azimuth, look direction in, in, in horizontal, and you likely will have a different incidence angle off of vertical. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so it, it just, you know, that is something that it's not typically done, you know, but there is the potential, you know, geometrically to sure. potentially get more out of the data. Anyways, just, just a, I don't know if it's a suggestion or a comment, but something, again, if you want to see what you can pull out of the data, something to consider. Uh, if, you, if your supervisor thinks that's not a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course, that's, I think that's worth to look at. Yeah, of course. Thank you very much. Corey, Corey Sorab has been fantastic at looking at those, uh, uh, what those rabbit holes would look like and, and, and finding positive outcomes out of getting into those. So I, it wouldn't surprise me if he comes up with something. Absolutely. Great. Um, I'm not sure if we have more questions on that, but uh, I appreciate your conversation, touch on the topic here. Um, in the chat box, we have another question from Jack Me. Um, is it possible that such minor one millimeter per year of movements could be false positive, or they fail to verify somehow? Can you give some comment on this? Sure. Well, um, the thing is, yes. The, the, I, I've heard different numbers in terms of accuracy of NSAR, anything from one, two millimeter per year up to five, sometimes 10 millimeter per year. That's a, that's a reasonable range of accuracy sometimes based on the wavelength of the satellites, also based on the numbers of the scenes, uh, based on the latitude of the place, because that affects the, the, the atmospheric, atmospheric situation of the site that can also impact the quality of NSAR results. And um, some what sorts of uh, scatters or objects you see on the site. Uh, so it, it really varies like, but for this specific site for the Old Man River Dam, because we had uh, quite a bit of number like images, um, I think the, the accuracy of one, two millimeter per year is quite reasonable. And uh, as, as we actually know, uh, like um, by the in-situ measurements and estimations that we kind of projected the long-term trends and, and, and kind of found out that it's going to like converging toward one millimeter per year. We, we, we kind of, uh, um, I think the inter results about the, like for the, for the spillway and the rock and the adjacent areas to it, is it, like, it doesn't, it makes sense. And I think that's why I say the range of accuracy is, is about one, two millimeter per year, because I think it's most likely to be, to be false positive at some point. Like for half of them is, is, is correctly showing one millimeter per year or less than one millimeter per year downward for the vertical component. But so for some of them, for a few points, it's showing bulging movements, but I think um, it's probably because of the accuracy. And I think, yeah, one, two millimeter per year would be reasonable to something. Thank you, Sarah. I also saw um, Dr. Martin hands up. So maybe Armin, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. Uh, sure, thanks Thanks very much. Uh, uh, that was a nice presentation. What, one of the, um, uh, uh, just a comment first with regard to uh, the old man dam. Um, I think, you know, you. Well, you always have to be a little bit careful when you're looking at an embankment structure because the surface of the materials are always on the move, although they may be small. Uh, certainly uh, roads and uh, spillway structures, headworks and so on, obviously are permanent structures and should offer good reflectors. But I, I was more curious about, uh, about I think uh, maybe eight, nine years ago when we first were looking at uh, Ripley, we put out corner reflectors, and I don't hear, you know, to improve the resolution. And I don't hear too much about corner reflectors being mentioned these days. Have they, has the software and technology overtaken the need for corner reflectors or would corner reflectors improve the signal? Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Martin, for attending this session today. It's an honor. Uh, so, for, for the old Mary River Dam, uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And uh, we'll, we'll sure, like, at some points we're looking at pixels one by one to make sure that you're getting uh, right values and it's not noise. 
and of course we'll we'll consider it in the next in the next analysis as well. But for 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 the corner reflectors, well, uh, the thing is, um, I, on off top of my head, um, we have nowadays very like satellites that's working with, with very high spatial resolution, and also some algorithms have been developed like recently, not recently, relative to other parts of geotechnical engineering. It's been recently developed uh, that 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 takes advantage of like some sort of a statistical characteristics of natural uh, reflectivity of these uh, natural matter materials like the boulders and rock outcrops and so and uh, like we have nowadays different subcategories of infrared called like a squeeze star that is being um, practiced by TR Altamira and we have SFAS we have PS INSAR and each of them each of these subsets kind of correspond to different applications, some for rural areas, some for urban areas. And I think the, the theory is now strong enough to find these scatterers, these natural scatterers with, with very high reliability, with, with very uh, high reliability. And, um, but reflectors are still being used. As far as I know, they're mostly used for co-registering the stack of images to make sure that they're geocoded correctly and they're on top of each other and each pixel are kind of um, on top of the, the the exact same pixel at other locations. So to, to kind of geocode the uh, ground control point, these corner reflectors are, reflectors are being used mostly recently. But um, I think, um, well, it, it kind of, it always comes down to the application and sort of range of movements. And for example, if you're going to, if you're going to, uh, I don't know, I think so. If you're going to look at a very slow moving landslide and using the, the satellite with a very long wavelength, that, way, that satellite is going to be very kind of uh, indifferent to that slow moving landslide because the longer the wavelength is, the um, less, um, less displacement to pick up from a slow moving ground. So for example, for, for increasing the accuracy, people can install corner reflectors as well, I think so. And also, yeah, um, sometimes probably for military applications as well. Yeah, I think so. Well, you know, we have a lot of our uh, infrastructure uh, is built on clay shells, which valley rebound and all those things. So, I mean, the old man dam is a classic example. And almost every dam I've ever looked at ha always has an annual cycle associated with it. You know, whether it's related to reservoir uh, loading on loading or whether it's related to yeah. temperature rocking back and forth for concrete structures and so on. So this kind of technology, you know, adds a dimension, which is normally very difficult to pick up. So good for you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I think the, the two, like the two obstacles that I, that I think uh, makes, like prevents NSAR to be used more is one of, one of things is, like uh, that it's incapability of monitoring um, vegetative areas. So for now, that, and that's a hardware issue. So you have to use a satellite with a very long wavelength. And for now, I don't think we have it for now. So the, the satellites that we have, uh, for example, the C band and the L band kind of penetrates toward the mid part of the canopy. And the second, uh, the second actual obstacle in our application is the revisiting time, uh, because it's usually more than 12 days for most of the satellites. But um, for in terms of the accuracy, it's going pretty well. Like we have seen very big improvements uh, in terms of both the theory and then the uh, at the theory end and also at the end of the uh, hardware in launching the satellites with very very like high resolutions uh, in the space in the space. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you um, for the multiple question. Thank you, Sarah, for the answer. And uh, we also have a uh, comments from Corey too in the chat box. Maybe comment more on the use of the um, reflectors it's just mentioned in the conversation. And uh, yeah, it's more of an update. Um, <laughs> Uh, Dr. Martin was uh, actively supported the installation of a whole bunch of corner reflectors with uh, one of his students back in 2006 on a slope in uh, 
central Alberta. And I've just recently been looking at um, Sentinel data over those satellites and over those reflectors, and they're providing wonderful data just as a follow up. So um, that's the highway I think 49 crossing of the Little Smoky River in northern Alberta. So, anyways, it's um, if you ever want to have a look at a site that has a lot of reflectors, Sora, um, and look, then that's one. Okay, sure. Corey, 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 has, has, has BC Hydro installed any corner reflectors uh, in some of their forested areas? I, I do know that um, we installed um, a few for checkerboard maybe about a, two years ago, but that was targeted for the ground-based insight ground right? above, above, above that, um, above of that um, slope toe that is bare rock. Yeah, no, they've they've actually invested in L-band in ALOS data. So mm -hmm. they've, they've got a pretty extensive INSAR program underway and more being planned um, over the Columbia, upper and lower Columbia systems using L-band. Um, and, and the L-band's been amazing. Um, yeah, I'll have to show it to you sometime. So, but yeah, if you only have access to C-band data and you have critical sites, you know, reflectors are definitely something uh, to consider but that being said the satellite needs to see them and uh, mm. so you need to find a place to put them or or clear trees which often isn't <laughs> something that others want to do anyways but yeah l l band data which is expensive is is where we typically go on that type of terrain yeah okay thanks all right thank you everyone i'm not sure if anyone still have any important questions to ask to conclude this seminar. Thank you again, Sir, for being here and um, give us a nice talk on your research. And also really appreciate uh, the conversation between some of us here. Quickly, thank you everyone for being this seminar and um, we will have an, another one, I think next week or the week after. Other than that, I just hope everyone have a good day. Looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much for having me. Take care, everybody. Bye.